This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Fighting continues in Ethiopia's Tigray region as the UN voices concern over the worsening humanitarian situation. Another breakthrough in Libya. Rival factions have agreed to hold elections in 18 months. And Felicia and Kabuga pleads not guilty to accusations of bankrolling the Rwandan genocide. A pleasure to have you with us today. Welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. Also coming up on the program. In business news, Nigeria's cabinet has formally approved the ratification of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And in your sport, Burkina Faso welcomes Malawi in a 2021 Africa Cup of Nations Group B qualifier showdown. And we begin with an update from Ethiopia's Tigray region, where fighting continued overnight as Ethiopian National Defense Forces continue with their offensive against regional forces. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed ordered troops into the region last week, accusing the regional forces of attacking a federal military base. CGTN's Girum Chala joins us with more now on that development from Addis Ababa. Girum, thanks for joining us on Africa Live. What more do we have from the front line? Beatrice, as you said, in the northern Ethiopia Tigray region of the state, the National Defense Force are still engaging uh, forces loyal to the TPLF, that's the regional state's uh, leading party itself. War has con continued overnight. Heavy fightings are happening, at least in six locations in that region. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, on his uh, Facebook official account, has announced that Western Tigray has been freed from the uh, hold of the TPLF army itself. And there, gruesome reports are also coming out, according to Gurum Chala there joining us from Addis Ababa. We will return to him in a moment if we can. Well, let's now return to Gurum Chala. I understand he's um, back on the line with us. Gurum, could you give us an update of what's going on? Well, Beatrice, uh, in the northern Ethiopia, Tigray regional state, the fightings uh, have continued and overnight uh, heavy fightings at are happening at least in six locations in Tigray. And the National Defense Forces are engaging the regional forces which are loyal to TPLF, that is the regional party in power at the moment. Uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed on his uh, official Facebook account said uh, that uh, soldiers have been found, uh, you know, tied up and killed by uh, gruesome. He said that Western Tigray at the moment is uh, freed from the hold of the uh, TPLF. And TPLF, on the other side, says this is not true and we are still holding some of the most important locations in Western Tigray. It is hard to find information which is true from that side. Beatrice, on the other hand, the Ethiopian parliament has just announced that uh, at least 39 members of parliament, almost all of them from Tigray region, uh, their immunity has been lifted by the parliament's decision today. So fighting has continued and lots of locations, according to the government, has been falling in the hands of the defense forces, Beatrice. Well, Giron, the humanitarian situation remains a major cause of concern. How is this being addressed? Well, the humanitarian situation is really a worrying factor, not only for locals here, but also for the United Nations, the African Union, and many other humanitarian organizations. At the moment, we hear that due to localities and villages and are crossing the border to Sudan. Thousands are reportedly now in Sudan, and Sudanese authorities are also reporting that they are receiving so many uh, troops included in them, so many Ethiopian nationals who are escaping the fighting in the northern part of the country. Now, the government says that it is addressing the situation as well, the humanitarian situation in that area. Again, uh, the prime minister said that uh, in some of the freed areas, 
the soldiers and the government is uh, providing food, uh, water, and also medical services for the people who are affected by the fightings. So uh, really, it is uh, hard to tell what is really exactly happening, but the reports coming from the government are one source, and the Sudanese authorities are also saying uh, that many people are crossing their borders. We have to also understand that fighting has continued, so so many people will be falling victim in the coming uh, few days, Beatrice, and this is really, really a worrying factor for the United Nations and uh, others. Igerum Chala joining us there from Addis Ababa with that update. But let's shift to Tunisia, where parties in the political talks on Libya's future have reached an agreement to hold elections within 18 months. As according to the United Nations Acting Libya Envoy Stephanie Williams, the talks have brought together 75 Libyan participants chosen by the United Nations. CGTN's Nick Mudimba reports. The meeting has reached preliminary agreement on a roadmap to free, fair, inclusive and credible parliamentary and presidential elections. The UN also says this will also include steps to unite institutions. They outlined clear steps for reaching these elections, including agreement on a constitutional basis. According to the process they outlined, elections will be held in no more, no more than 18 months. The roadmap also outlines steps for uniting Libya's institutions, restoring public services, and to begin a, in a very important process of national reconciliation and transitional justice, and to quickly address the issue of those displaced inside and outside of Libya who must be allowed to return to their homes in safety and dignity with guarantees that their rights to housing, land, and properties will be protected. Libya has been in chaos since 2011 and divided since 2014 between rival factions in the East and West. Major institutions have also split and some are controlled by armed groups ever since the crisis began. The internationally recognized government of national accord holds power in the capital Tripoli. Khalifa Haftar's Libyan National Army, on the other hand, holds away in the east. With both sides riven by political, regional and ideological divisions, many Libyans remain skeptical of peacemaking efforts. However, the Tunis talks follow a ceasefire that the GNA and LNA agreed last month in Geneva. The UN says that the talks in Tunis will focus on a new unified transitional government to oversee the run-up to elections. Nick Mudimba, CGTN. Cote d'Ivoire's president-elect Alassane Ouattara and opposition leader Henri Conan Bedier have met as they try to resolve their differences over the recently held elections. The October 31st poll led to a conflict in the Francophone nation. The two leaders have been at loggerheads with Bedier disputing Ouattara's legitimacy as president. Bedier had earlier opposed Ouattara's quest for a third term, calling it unconstitutional. There are hopes that the meeting held in Abidjan will help restore peace in the country. The two leaders have agreed to press ahead with talks to resolve the dispute. It was a brotherly meeting to restore confidence and to ensure that Ivory Coast finds peace. And we have agreed that peace is the thing that is the most precious to both of us and to all Ivorians. And we have decided to work in that direction and this was a first meeting as the president said, to break the ice and establish trust, and we have agreed to meet again very soon in order to continue this dialogue, which has started well, and trust has been restored. I have nothing to add other than that at today's meeting, we broke the wall of ice, the silence, and that we will, in the days and weeks to come, we will continue to talk to each other, meet, in order to bring the country back to what it was before. Thank you. Rwandese businessman Felician Kabuga has appeared in a United Nations court charged with five counts of genocide. Kabuga remained silent throughout the hearing. His lawyer, however, registered a not guilty plea on his behalf. Felician Kabuga was arrested in May in France and transferred to a UN detention center in The Hague at the end of October. During an extradition hearing in France, 
Kabuga dismissed the accusations against him as lies. A long-running political rivalry in the Democratic Republic of Congo is threatening to drag the country into a deeper crisis. Government reforms have stalled amid a row between President Felix Shisekedi and his predecessor Joseph Kabila over the appointment of officials to key positions. President Shisekedi has now called for national consultations to chart a new path for the country. CJ Samringa has that report from Kinshasa. President Felix Chisekedi signed a power sharing deal with his president Joseph Kabila after he failed to get a majority in parliament. The deal paved the way for the formation of a government. But members of the ruling coalition, composed of Kabila's Common Front for Congo and Chisekedi's Cap for Change party, have disagreed over several issues. Their differences have now come to a head prompting President Chisekedi to call for national consultations with political, religious and opinion leaders. President Chisekedi was open and is still open to work with anyone. And that was the design for the country's sake to go forward. However, the other party, it was not the case. And I think it, they, they really had malicious ideas. Uh, they had malicious ideas uh, trying really not to lift up the country, but really to sink it and with the president with it. But members of Kabila's coalition have dismissed the accusations leveled against them. Our colleagues are using the common front for Congo as a scapegoat for all of the failures of the government. In reality, we haven't blocked any project. The key obstacle that the president is facing comes from his entourage. His inner circle has many people who have no idea about running public affairs. Congolese citizens, fed up with the bickering in the ruling coalition, expressed their support for the president's initiative by marching along the streets of the capital, Kinshasa, on Saturday. We believe the time has come for our leaders and political actors to design new ways to govern our country for the good of all people. We are not interested in the FCC, Kach or the Lamuka coalition. All we want is good policies that will enable us to live better lives. The ongoing talks initiated by the president seek to get views from Congolese citizens about setting up a new political outfit known as the Sacred Union. The union is supposed to replace the ruling coalition that's been beset by differences among its leaders. The national consultations held by President Chisekedi have sparked a lot of anger among members of Joseph Kabila's coalition, FCC. The coalition holds the majority in parliament and the Senate. Its top leadership has held a series of meetings and made it clear that they won't take any plans to break up the coalition lying down. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Well, let's shift our focus to China, where celebrations have been held for the 30th anniversary of the development and opening up of Pudong in Shanghai. Chinese President Xi Jinping delivered a speech. Pudong, new area, was established in 1990. The economic zone helped transform a country of farms into a major driving force of national development. Pudong became a model for the rest of the country on how to launch reforms and achieve high-quality development. So how big have the changes been in Pudong over the past three decades and what made them possible? Gao Yimi explains. Pudong, named after the east bank of the Huangpu River, rests at the intersection of China's coastal belt and the Yangtze River estuary. It's backed by the Yangtze River Delta urban megalopolis and faces the boundless Pacific. The region is known for hosting multiple pioneering centers in Shanghai, including the Glici Financial Subdistrict of Lu Jiazui, which boasts more foreign-funded financial institutions than most other Chinese cities. Zhang Jiang is dedicated to Pudong's efforts to build up into a sci-tech innovation center with the establishment of its high-tech park in 1992. And Wai Gaochao is home to China's first ever free trade zone it's tested up to 100 pilot policies, 
Many of them, including the negative list mechanism for foreign investment, have been promoted nationwide. With a population of 5.5 million, Pudong is often regarded as a symbol of China's reform and opening up, and the epitome of Shanghai's modernization. On this small patch of land covering just one eight thousandth of China, Pudong created one eightieth of the country's GDP last year. It topped 190 billion U.S. dollars, and its per capita GDP stood at around 33,000 U.S. dollars, also a leading figure nationwide. The supportive environment also increased Pudong's appeal for international investors. Over the past 30 years, it's attracted foreign investment of almost 103 billion U.S. dollars. In 2019, it contributed to one fifteenth of China's total import and export trade volumes. With all these high-profile achievements, Pudong is expected to make greater strides in the near future, as the region continues to lead China's high-quality development. Gao Yiming, CGTN. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang and leaders of ASEAN countries are meeting via video link for the 23rd ASEAN-China Summit. This year's event is being held offline because of the COVID-19 pandemic. In his opening remarks, Li hailed joint achievements and called for cooperation and dialogue. This meeting is convened against a special backdrop. China and ASEAN have been working together to fight the coronavirus. Through our concerted efforts, we have made gains in this front in all our countries. In this process, we have looked out for each other and shared experience and useful practices in combating the virus. China and ASEAN have been among the first in all countries to open fast tracks and green lanes to facilitate economic reopening. China-ASEAN trade has grown against the headwinds. ASEAN has become China's biggest trading partner for the first three quarters. Going forward, China will continue to work with ASEAN countries on the path of peaceful development to uphold peace and stability in our region. Through dialogue and consultation, we will continue to work with each other to address the differences and disputes between our countries. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. Experts warn that plastic pollution in South Africa has reached crisis levels. And we have the latest updates from the U.S. election of fallout. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adventure, Tunis, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. Donald Trump has made his first formal public appearance since Joe Biden was projected to win the election. Trump and the First Lady Melania marked Veterans Day at Arlington National Cemetery, laying a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Donald Trump did not speak, but he continues insisting he did not lose his re-election bid. Biden honored military veterans in Philadelphia. William Denslow has more on the transition to the White House. The former vice president was in Philadelphia. He attended the Korean War Memorial, where he didn't give any public addresses or respond to uh, the media. And we expect that trend to continue throughout a Tuesday as uh, Joe Biden continues to work behind the scenes uh, with his close advisors. Now, when it comes to the work for Joe Biden, to try and 
uh, get his transition team in order. Just this week, the former vice president conceded uh, that not receiving daily intelligence briefings would, uh, he said that receiving them would be useful, but said that is not slowing down the work of his team, of course. Joe Biden has said that dealing with the coronavirus pandemic is a key uh, priority for them, of course, as COVID cases surge in the United States. Joe Biden has said this week that um, wearing masks should not be a political statement. We also know uh, that Vivek Murthy, a advisor for uh, Joe Biden, has addressed and held a meeting uh, with members of Senate Democrats. We also understand that Joe Biden is working on compiling his agency review teams. What we understand is that he's putting together a list of around 500 or so experts with a couple of key priorities as far as the transition is concerned. We understand that these experts are really working and their tasks include uh, helping to ensure a smooth transition of power, as well as helping the likes of Joe Biden, his running mate Kamala Harris, as well as uh, the cabinet once it is selected to help ensure that they're able to hit the ground running come January. William Denslow, CGTN in Wilmington, Delaware. Well, Joe Biden has appointed top Democratic official Ron Klain as his chief of staff. Klain is one of Biden's closest confidants, working with him for more than three decades, including when Biden was vice president. Klain has served as the coordinator of the Ebola response in the Obama administration. He is a fierce critic of Trump's handling of the coronavirus and is expected to play a central role in Biden's response to the crisis. A recount has begun in the state of Georgia. All of the paper ballots from last week's presidential election will be counted again by hand by November the 20th. Democrats Joe Biden beat President Donald Trump by a very small margin in Georgia, and state law requires automatic recounts in close elections. Overall, Biden remains the projected winner of the presidency, but Trump has refused to concede, claiming without any evidence that the voting was marred by fraud. Hundreds of residents living near the coastlines of Manila are being evacuated with Typhoon Vamco expected to pass near the Philippine capital today. It began battering northeastern Philippine provinces on Wednesday. At least one person is dead and three others are missing. Only weeks ago, the country was battered by the strongest cyclone so far this year. Thousands of residents in coastal communities have been ordered to evacuate. We have advised our residents to evacuate early since our village is prone to strong winds and flooding. Well, the Philippines is hit by an average of 20 storms and typhoons every year. Typhoon Vamco is the third powerful cyclone in 11 days. Officials say nearly 200,000 people have been evacuated. More than 160,000 were in emergency centers by Wednesday night. A report by the World Wildlife Fund has warned that plastic pollution in South Africa has reached crisis levels and polluters should be held to account. The WWF Plastics Facts and Futures report explores the environmental and socio-economic impacts of plastic pollution in South Africa. CGTN Jelisa Njamela has more. An important message that the report aims to relay is that pollution is not an individual person's problem alone, that large industries should be held responsible as well for the problem that they help create. The WWF stresses that for far too long, the burden of plastic pollution has been put in the hands of consumers with a heavy emphasis on awareness, recycling and cleanup operations. The organization notes that it is becoming increasingly clear that the problem of plastic in the environment needs to be tackled by all players, including producers, recyclers, and end-of-life cycle stakeholders. So I think the key thing about this report is that it sort of opens up everyone's eyes to the fact that it's not only the consumer's responsibility to deal with the pollution, okay, it's everyone's responsibility. Um, and that it's not a quick fix. Obviously, we need collaboration with all stakeholders, as I've mentioned. Government themselves have you know, already implemented uh, policies that support a circular economy, such as the extended producer responsibility uh, regulations. But I think you know, having industry take on a bit more responsibility as well would be a huge outcome for the report. 
The report identifies plastic products beyond packaging that need to be given attention here in South Africa. These include sanitary towels, disposable nappies and cigarette butts amongst others. Up says the report also highlights this country's need for a systemic approach to tackle plastic pollution. We need to transition from what's called a linear plastics economy to something that's more circular, right? Where we are redesigning, rethinking, reusing, repairing and recycling our products over and over again um, to avoid it ending up in the environment. Up further assess that the report reveals that interventions by environmentalists such as beach cleanups do not curb the pollution as it needs to be stopped at source. He uses the recent case of nurdles washing up on beaches in Cape Town to illustrate this point. Beach cleanups are, are critical, you know, they, they help raise awareness about the plastic pollution crisis. Um, but unfortunately, again, you know, not really addressing the root cause of the problem. So in South Africa, we import about 45% of plastic raw materials, um, which we then produce into various products and packaging. And that means that a lot of you know, nurdles are on their way to South Africa and are imported here. So it's a consistent risk, uh, you know, to the marine ecosystem. So, you know, until we have better regulation, better monitoring of not only the plastics value chain, but also how those nurdles are transported around the world, it's always going to be a problem. Nurdles are small plastic pellets used as a raw material in the manufacture of plastic products. But their very nature, they're difficult to locate sift through and sort and ultimately remove from a natural environment. You listen to Mela for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. In Kenya, authorities are turning to a mix of metro, rail and buses in order to end the capital's notorious traffic jams. State-owned public transport fell into disrepair in the 1990s and that vacuum was filled by a mix of private taxi operators and a sharp rise in car ownership. As CGTN's Robert Nagila reports, authorities aim to change both trends. No matter the time, moving from one place to another in Nairobi always feels like rush hour. The situation is even worse in the city centre, whose streets are dominated by privately owned minibuses. It is estimated that traffic here in the capital Nairobi costs the economy about half a million dollars a day. And now the government's trying to do something about it. On Tuesday, President Uhuru Kenyatta commissioned five new commuter trains that connect 10 stations in high-density suburbs around the capital to the central railway station. The commuter service is integrated with the bus rapid transit system that will ferry passengers from train stations to other bus termini. The service will have day-long hourly train services to and from these stations, giving our commuters greater flexibility in terms of their travel schedule. An additional 20 mini stations connecting the city and various residential areas are under construction and the government set to add six diesel multiple units to meet the rising demand for rail transport. We expect in every one hour that uh, we'll be having about 40,000 people exiting and then getting through this station. That will bring the number of passengers using the commuter service to 3 million per month. But not everyone's happy. Mini taxi operators will no longer be allowed to access the city centre, a move they say will affect their earnings. COVID has already affected the business. We have not overcome that hurdle and they are putting more hurdles in front of us. They should not have introduced the buses. But for commuters, the introduction of a rail commuter service and a bus transit system is long overdue. As a Nairobian, I'm going to benefit, I'm going to reach home on time. It's going to be cost effective and also it's going to reduce the traffic jam. For Nairobi's residents, after decades of being left at the mercy of unruly taxis who are a law unto themselves, a whole new experience awaits them. Robert Nagelo, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Africa has many interesting and varied ancient cultures. One of them is the unique Nok culture in Nigeria's northern state of Kaduna. It is one of West Africa's earliest civilizations. 
figurines found around 500 BC in the Nok region have gained a place in museums around the world. See GTN's Kalechi Emekalam tells us more. Nigeria's Nok Museum, located in the northwest, holds a fascinating tale of culture and prolific arts. It's become prominent thanks to its distinct roughly 2,000-year-old figurines called the Nok Terracotta. The Nok culture is the first in West Africa to claim the creative artistry of these baked clay statues as its own. Many attach sacred significance to these figurines that are now found in several Nok sites. The terracotta wasn't created by us. Our forefathers found it while the miners were mining tin that they found them. Now the terracotta became the roots of harm culture, like the symbol of our tradition, and anywhere it is seen in the world, knows that it is from Nok and Nok is harm culture. Even in very in contemporary arts, people attach some spiritual meaning to the works that artists do, especially when they cannot understand um, what the artist is trying to portray. So it is normal, especially for, uh, for items that have been dug out from the ground. It is normal when they didn't know anything about it, they will always arrogate spiritual um, meanings to them. But the natural sense for us, scientifically, they simply tell us the story of what life was. Archaeological findings reveal that early settlers in the Nok region had a structured society with a level of civilization. It is seen in the distinct features of the terracotta, elaborate hairstyles, trinkets and facial piercings. Although the traditional arts are found in museums around the world, many of them were taken out illegally. They are kept in, in various museums around the world, but Nigeria has the the, the right and ownership of the work. So we have them in the Nigerian museums and there are people who also have them as private collections. Some of the arts have been looted, but the National Commission for Museums and Monument has done a lot in managing it. We have also tried to ensure that those who have those items that have been looted and taken outside this country through bilateral and multilateral interaction with the world community with the international community, Nigeria has been able to retrieve some of these works and it is always in the public glare when we receive them. The younger generation in Nok is eager to pass down the culture. The terracotta here remains a major symbol of Nigeria's material and spiritual heritage. Kelechi Mekalam, CGT and Kaduna, Nigeria. And we still have more news for you here on the program. Here's what's ahead. Nigeria's cabinet has formally approved the ratification of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that, and you devoted to the energy sector. Problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Nigeria's cabinet has formally approved the ratification of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. That deal, as you might recall, was signed by Nigeria's President Muhammadu Buhari in Niger last July. Nigeria's information minister made the announcement after a virtual meeting of the cabinet presided over by President Buhari. Nigeria had withheld ratification of the deal after it signed the trade agreement last year, saying it wanted assurances over some grey areas and to make further consultations with local manufacturers. Egypt's cabinet has released new regulations that require most commercial establishments to close early as, author as authorities grapple with measures to contain the COVID-19 pandemic while avoiding a complete shutdown of the economy. Egypt has about 109,000 active cases, 
100,000 people have recovered, while the disease has killed 6,380 people. From Cairo, here's CGTN's Yasa Hakim. Mustafa Wa'il owns this small shop that sells electricity equipment in Egypt's capital. He says the government's decision to order shops to close in 10 p.m. is a bid to curb COVID-19 infections and will have a negative effect on some businesses, including his. It is in our culture and habits that we stay up late. Egyptians like to do their shopping and outings at night. That is why closing early will cut our revenue stream further. I already had to let my workers go because I can't pay them anymore due to the recession caused by the pandemic's fallout. But I believe health comes first, so I agree with the government decision. Officials have blamed citizens and business owners for not sticking to health regulations. Secret inspections of 155 facilities have led to the complete closure of 55 restaurants and cafes that have violated anti-coronavirus measures. More inspections are underway. Official government statistics show there are 700,000 registered workers in the services industry, but an official numbers show there could be as high as 3 million. I agree with the early closing hours directive, but there should be compensation for workers, especially in cafes and restaurants, who are set to lose the most from this situation. The North African nation's government is trying to avoid a second wave of coronavirus during winter, which could be more deadly than the previous one, and has threatened to impose a total lockdown if the situation doesn't improve. There's a strong connection between a lockdown and loss of jobs everywhere in the world. Egypt has managed to keep it in check, and we want to maintain this. So I'm calling on business owners, employees, and everyone else to adhere to health precautions to avoid this scenario. Meanwhile, officials and media are telling people to maintain social distancing, wear masks, and stay away from closed and crowded places. Although the infections are relatively low, at just over 200 per day, the government has put its hospitals on high alert as a precautionary measure, just in case the numbers keep rising. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. Tunisia's central bank says the 61% plunge in tourism revenue is mostly attributable to the COVID-19 pandemic. Tunisia relies heavily on its tourism sector for foreign currency earnings and jobs. Now, though, it faces the threat of seeing thousands of businesses declaring bankruptcy as foreign tourist traffic and spending evaporates. This protest of tour operators and travel agents has become an ordinary scene in downtown Tunis, where thousands of players in the tourism industry are facing an economic crisis. Drawn from various regions across the country, these business owners have been expressing their anger at the government for failing to cushion their businesses from collapse since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic in March. There's zero activity, zero salaries, no money since March. Tourism professionals have no resources. This is a catastrophic situation. Industry players say that the government has failed to meet its promises to over 400,000 people working in the tourism industry. Already, tens of thousands of jobs have been lost following the first and the ongoing second wave of the pandemic. Tourism professionals are suffering. The state must react and help us. We are fed up with empty promises. We are forced to pay our loans, leasing social security contributions and taxes. While we don't have any resources, the tourism sector cannot be abandoned by the government. The country's prime minister declared that the 2020 complementary state budget will provide for supporting the tourism industry. The tourism sector is in crisis globally. There are many difficulties due to the COVID-19 crisis. The state is looking for concrete solutions in the new budget in consultation with the professionals who are struggling while fighting for this pillar of the national economy. The Tunisian government has recently banned travel between the country's regions during the holidays, suspended schools and public gatherings and extended a curfew as it tries to contain a rapid surge of COVID-19 cases. 
Experts believe that these decisions have further deepened the crisis in the tourism industry. According to the National Institute of Statistics, the number of tourists rose 13.6% to 9.5 million in 2019. However, less than 5 million people, including Tunisian residents abroad, have visited the country until the first week of November. Admin Shabushi, CGTN, Tunis. In the face of a rising tide of COVID-19 cases, Algeria's government is tightening pandemic response measures. The curfew will now run from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. in 29 of the country's 48 districts. Circulation of public and private transport will be suspended on weekends countrywide. The measures are in effect for the next 15 days. The quarantine has seriously affected our business. And although my sons help me here in the shop, the expenses remain very high and the assistance provided by the state is minimal and insufficient. Frankly, I will not take long to close my business and leave this store. The situation has become very severe and I cannot bear any more patience. Customers are becoming very few and there is a recession in trade. And if new measures are adopted to fight against COVID-19 by forcing us to close the shop, this will be a great disaster and its consequences are dire. I don't think that merchants will withstand much if a total quarantine is imposed that forces them to close their stores. If we, the customers, will be harmed by that, then how will they be? I believe that new approaches must be considered that protect all segments of society. South Africa's seasonally adjusted manufacturing output rose by 3.2 percent month-on-month in September. This followed month-on-month -month cha changes of 3.3 percent in August and 5.6 percent in July. CGTN's Angelo Coppola examines the data. Seasonally adjusted manufacturing production increased by 32.9 percent in the third quarter of 2020, compared with the second quarter. All 10 manufacturing divisions reported positive growth rates over that period. We're probably going to see the biggest bounce back uh, ever of manufacturing uh, in the third quarter. Uh, it's probably going to be over 100% uh, increase on the quarter before. However, we must just keep in mind that this is a, the 16th consecutive of year-on-year -year decline. The steel and metals industry is feeling a little bit more positive than during the previous month. So from our side, I think uh, it's positive news because we're seeing a little bit of an uh, uptick in terms of our uh, production base. Uh, the only concern we have is uh, that not, uh, if you look at the data let's, uh, and categorize it according to the uh, sector segments, you will find that no, uh, it's, it remains uh, a, a pressurized environment in terms of what's happening within the metal industry. There is other data that is suggesting to analysts that the country may have turned a corner. PMI uh, seems to be on the upward trajectory, uh, looking at the data that came out last, uh, last month as well. I think we're also seeing a little bit of a peak in terms of business confidence, which is quite uh, positive for us. Uh, capacity utilization, I can say, remains quite weak. Looking ahead, South Africa...
documented her life as an urban farmer in Kibera, Kenya's largest informal settlement. It has been six months since schools were closed in Kenya because of COVID-19. But for teacher Pamela, keeping hopes high for a better tomorrow is what keeps her going. As the mother of three children, Pamela has not just been sitting around waiting for the situation to change. She has found other ways to feed and support her family. She has since taken up farming at a nearby field next to the railway line. Here, she has planted vegetables. People must eat. Whichever situation people are in, people must eat. So the idea of farming came immediately in my mind. And then somebody told me along the railway line, there's some dump site, there are bushes, but if cleared, they can be turned into useful land. And then I decided immediately to come and see and they do and they change the place from being wasteful to useful. The small garden has not only been a source of food for our family, but also a source of income. After harvesting, we have to take a portion for our consumption at the, at the family level. And then the surplus we can sell. Moline, who used to work with Pamela in the same school as a cook, says it is a form of business that is helping her family a lot. The business has helped me put food on the table. Since COVID-19, I have not been able to make a living. Since starting the business, I can now put food on the table. But even in this, challenges abound. Lack of water for irrigation has made her new assignment an uphill task. Kenya's Ministry of Education has already reopened learning institutions. And Pamela says she has no reason to abandon agriculture. I would love to report back to my profession of teaching, but farming will be my part-time my part job. I will even employ somebody or some few people to be assisting me in, in harvesting, weeding, so, so as to make the farm clean. Most teachers like Pamela who work in private schools have not been paid their salary since schools were closed in March, losing her only source of livelihood. Life in Kibera, the biggest slum in Africa at this time of COVID-19 pandemic, has been devastating. This is her newfound passion, her new job, growing different types of vegetables to support her family. She tells me this has improved her food security. Sylvia Diambo, CGTN. Let's now take a look at your sports news. Here's what's ahead. Burkina Faso welcomes Malawi in our 2021 Africa Cup of Nations Group B qualifier showdown. Africa Live. Find your voice.